too. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. All right. Um, anyone with the prayer requests? Uh, since I'm doing it, it's not. It's no hold barge up here. Brother Bob. For the Billy. That's right. Brother Billy Kirsch. He is at home. All right. Any, yes, sir. All right. Ron Cameron. Better late than never. How about that? We got it. Who's on mine? For Dalton Goblin? No, okay. All right. Because I got to just, everybody starts looking. I like it. Yes, ma'am. All right. Tasha Martin with cancer and COVID and pneumonia. I got a praise. Yes, ma'am. Miss Peggy. Miss Peggy's a praise. She's here. Yes, sir. Amen. All right. Miss Peggy's the backbone of the office up here. If y'all don't know that. If she goes missing, I don't know what's going to happen. Stephanie's going to have to step up. All right. Miss Ellen, can we pray for Miss Ellen Griffith? She's like, why are y'all praying for me? That's what she said. All right. Diane Mason with. All right. Yes, Brother Richard. Say self. Okay. All right. Jack and April self with COVID and David B. Smith, broken collarbone and shoulder. Anybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Again. Basketball team, volleyball team, right? Yep. I know Carly's been talking about it. I guess anytime you travel, it's kind of exciting. I just, it doesn't matter who you travel with. I travel with a doozy, I will tell you that. We went to Romania, and uh, he's part, I can't say this, I'm on mic, I can't say that. Praise the Lord for Canadians, amen. I tried to be nice. Y'all know it's hard sometimes for me to be nice. I know, can you believe that? Brother Josh, can you believe that? I, just, I did break my streak last week on being nice. If you want to know more about that, see Brother Josh. <sighs> anyway, just the way people, I, I'll work at it. Work at being nice, not being mean. Some people just, that, that, that type, Brother Josh. <laughs> I try, I try. I try being nice, not try being mean. <sighs> Jesus help us today. Amen. Uh, let's see. Anybody, anyone with unspoken? Oh, Brother Caleb. Brother Caleb scratching his head back there. Unspoken. Many. All right. How did, y'all got three, three Wednesdays with me. So this is one. One of three. So I'll have a good joke for you next week. I do have a joke. It's just, you know, I, 
can't tell you. You know, it's not that it's bad or inappropriate. It's just I can't say. It. It's just I feel like it's it's not appropriate for people ever. I just know it. All right, <laughs> Brother Cooper, again, three times a charm. No, it's not bad. It's pretty funny. It's pretty. Fu- it's not bad. I just don't think it's appropriate for right here. <laughs> My wife goes, then is it appropriate? <laughs> We're going to have fun tonight. I'm just going to say this. All right. Uh, remember our, uh, we're going to move. We'll just keep moving. Remember people out of our church where the Burton Gates is going to start his church, uh, the second church there in Philly pretty soon. And then you can continue praying for Brother Jake there in Lafayette, Lafayette. I'm from Arkansas, really. And we got El Dorado. That's how we pronounce names, all right? All right, anybody else? Go on once. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pass the ammunition. All right. Brother Caleb, would you come up here, please? Yes. He's going to pray for us, and we're going to sing another song. We're going to take the offering. Come on, sir. Pray. Father Lord, we come here, Son. Uh, thank the Lord for this day. Thank the Lord for everything you've done for us. Thank the Lord for everything you've given us. And just uh, please help the message. That would be a blessing to you, Lord. Please help the singing. And just uh, please help our mindset that would be ready to listen to you, Lord. And just uh, thank you, Lord, for it. And please help us to get, go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Throw out the lifeline. Hymn number 106. Throw out the lifeline. Across the dark way. Let's stand one more time. At least just stand for me, I guess. <laughs> we'll sing all four verses of hymn number 106. Throw out the lifeline across the dark wave. There is a brother whom someone should save. Somebody. and billows of woe will soon hurl them out where the dark waters flow. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline, someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline, Someone 
ushers. Pass through the offering envelope. Remember, there's a ladies' meeting tomorrow night. 6.30? I just, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't go to the ladies' meeting. I just know that tomorrow is dinner. I don't know. If Liam or Finley had to choose, dinner would be McDonald's. I'm more of a, just a chicken person. I go for some Popeyes. That's what I think of. But it'd probably be McDonald's. One of those. All right. Brother Clint. Brother Clint. Dear Lord, thank you for I pray that you can keep us safe. I pray that you can bless the offering, and I pray that you can bless uh, the message by... Uh, Brother Chad, Lord, I pray that you can uh, give him the words to say. Thank you for everything that you do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Tonight we got Brother Owens with us. He's going to be here this Wednesday, next Wednesday, and the following Wednesday. So um, y'all make plans to be here. Uh, Pastor asked him to do a soul winning something, um, something. Mark your Bible, be in your place. Um, you will, I guarantee you 100%, I, there's no doubt about this, that you will have an opportunity to talk to someone about Jesus Christ, about leading them to their knowledge of salvation, okay? There's, there's, I mean, you go to a gas station, there's people there, okay? So we need this, not just you, we, me, we need this, all right? So be in your place every Wednesday night uh, coming up, and uh, Brother Chad's going to come. I don't know what he's doing, but he's going to preach. Well, somebody say Amen. Good to be in God's house tonight. Is this a watch? I don't know how to work it. Amen. Well, I've been looking forward to tonight, and I'll be honest with y'all, I wrote about 20 sermons, trying to get the right one, you know, and I had an idea of what I was going to do, and the Lord changed my mind just last night. So we're going to go with that one. If you would open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And when you're turning there, I'm going to take just a few minutes by way of introduction. Um, kind of tell you a little bit more. I mean, each time I get up, I'll tell you a little bit more about who I am and where I've been and what I've done. Not so that you can uh, say, wow, Brother Owens did this or that. But to show you what God can do with anybody under the sound of my voice. Because I, I know for a fact, if God can use somebody like me, there's not a soul in this room that God cannot use. There's not a person. And, you know, with my temperament and everything back when I was pastoring, and I, I'm not going to do it anymore, but I, I used to browbeat people. I mean, I really did. I was pretty rough at it. I was pretty rough on it. I'd get up and say, if you ain't so winning, you ain't right with God. Even though that's the truth, it's true. I was trying to beat the people up. And then I realized throughout time that people didn't go soul winning because, number one, they were afraid to. Number two, they were confused about it. And number three, there's people out there saying that soul winning doesn't work. 
And I, I want to put it before you tonight that I have seen the difference. I've seen the difference. In 20 years, I was at Unity Baptist Church. I was pastor for 14 years and right at nine months. I was a soul winner. I baptized 52 people a year, minimum. Minimum for 14 years. And that doesn't happen a lot if you're not out winning souls. You've got to win them before you can wet them. Somebody say amen right there. But if God's people won't take the message, then they won't get it. And I always used to tell my folks this. We've got to answer. And if we won't share it, who will? Do you think Kamala Harris is going to share it? Do you think Joe Biden is going to get up there at the White House podium and say uh, uh, that Jesus Christ died for their sins? Who's going to share it if we don't share it? Who's going to take the message to a lost and dying world if the people that Jesus loved and bled and died for don't love him enough to take his word and share it with a lost sinner? When I got saved, I got saved August 26, not far from yours, a few years later, August 26, 1996. I was an alcoholic. I told y'all that already. Y'all know that about me. I was not a good person. I hung out with a bunch of bad people because I was a bad people. Somebody say amen. I didn't, I mean, I was bad. And when I got saved that night, I was actually walking up the baptistry steps. And what happened was, is my wife got saved in Virginia when I was in the military. And we came back to Texas and we went to a non-denominational church. I told y'all about that. And then we went to a Baptist church. This Baptist preacher kept harassing me to come to church. So we went to church, and we joined that church. And, and see, when I was a kid, I got baptized in a Baptist church. So I just assumed I was okay. I got baptized in a Baptist church. I'm going to heaven. And we were there, and he told me, he said, You know, you, I proclaimed to be saved, which I wasn't. He said, You are okay. He said, But your wife got saved and baptized in a non-denominational church. He said, we can't accept her baptism. He said, it was an alien baptism, and I got mad. I said, there ain't nothing alien about my wife or her baptism. She got in water just like everybody else. I didn't understand. And he took the time to explain it to me. He says, look, he said, uh, uh, you know, explain uh, uh, the authority from Baptist, you know, one generation of Baptists to the next generation of Baptists, so on and so forth. Ecclesiology. He, he told me all that, and I said, oh, well, that makes sense. He said, do you think your wife will get baptized? I said, I doubt it. <laughs> She's hard-headed sometimes. And uh, he says, well, I tell you what, what if you get baptized with her as a family, starting out this new walk with God as a family? I said, well, okay. I mean, what's it going to hurt to get baptized again? So me and my wife talked about it, and we got baptized. But I was walking up the steps in the baptistry, and this still small voice, that night, I'll tell you, I remember the, the message just like it was today. 36 times my pastor said the only way into heaven was through Jesus Christ. He preached out of Acts chapter 4, verse number 12. There's none other name given under heaven whereby man must be saved. Save the name... Of Jesus. And I was walking up them baptistry steps and the thought came to my mind, why am I getting baptized? What am I doing? This ain't going to save me. That water's not going to save me. According to Pastor Cobb, there's only one way into heaven and that's through Jesus Christ. And I got on my knees that night on the steps of the baptistry. And I cried out to Jesus and I said something like this. I said, Lord, I know I ain't no good. And I know all these years I thought I was okay, but I found out tonight that Jesus, you're the only way I can get into heaven. And Lord, if you would tonight, would you save me? Just like you did my wife. And at that moment, and I don't go by feeling, folks. I, I'm not one of those. But I felt like a, a load. And you may not have got that. I had a heavy load. I'm telling you, I wasn't a good person. I was a drunk. I was an alcoholic. But I felt this load come off of me. And I was never and have never been the same since that night. 
August 26, 1996, at 7.15, I got saved because church got over, we, preaching was over at 7.10, we went and got dressed and all that. It was 7.15 in the evening. And Jesus Christ saved me. Well, here, you, you got to understand something. The Bible says, He says, forgiven much, loveth much. And I'm afraid sometimes we don't realize how much God has forgiven us for the things we've done. But I knew exactly the things that God forgave me for. And that next day I went to work, I had no idea what to do. I talked bad, folks. I'm, I'm sorry. I know none of y'all's ever cussed, but I did. I was a sailor, man. I, I, I'm telling you, I knew every word, and I even invented some of my own. And they were bad. I mean, every word that came out of my mouth was four letters. I couldn't make a sentence without at least four curse words. And I didn't even realize I got that bad until after I got saved. And I went into the break room, and I, I, I said, Hey, y'all, blankety-blank, so I'll listen up. And I hit the deal, and I said, Look at me. I said, I want to tell you something. Every person in here is going to die and go to hell. And they said, What? I said, Shut up, you blankety-blank. Listen to me. I said, I'm going to tell you what God did for me last night. I didn't know what I was doing, and I didn't even realize until there was a, a veteran Christian there. He pulled me to the side. He said, Brother. <laughs> I said, Yes, sir. He said, How are you going to talk to them like that about Jesus Christ? I said, Like what? I'm just telling them they're going to go to hell. He said, You can't curse them out and tell them about the love of God. And I felt about that tall. So the next night I went in there, and you all want to know something? Even though, let, let me tell you how much God loves us. Even though I didn't do it right, and I wasn't right, I had one man in there got saved that night. And I didn't even know how to tell him what to do. All I knew was is Nathan Brewer was his name. And every time I see him now, he, he says, do you still talk like that? I said, no, sir. I said, the Lord's cleaned that up. But Nathan Brewer got saved that night, and, and he came to our church. It wasn't long after that, but I just realized that next day when I went to work, I had to tell everybody that there was a way not to go to hell because I knew I was going to hell. And when Jesus saved me, I want it for everybody else. I want everybody I meet to go to heaven. I want every person in this world. You know that God didn't make hell for man? He made hell for the devil and his angels. And he gave us the greatest thing when he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross. It's called the gospel, the good news. He gave us the greatest message in the world. All he says is just give it to them. Give it to them. What stops us from doing it? What stops you from talking to that person at the gas station? Fear? Yeah, fear. Maybe you're afraid you're going to mess up and not say the right thing. I mean, I'm not picking on you. I'm just telling you. Maybe you read some books that said soul and it hurts people more than it helps them. You know, I was handed a book the other night at the conference. It's, it's called Who Moved the Goalpost? I read five pages up, throw it down, said, I ain't reading that. They said that we're killing people and sending them to hell by going soul winning. They said there's no way you can walk up to a complete stranger and tell them the gospel and that person gets saved. I've got news for you tonight. I, I serve a living God that stepped out on nothing and made everything. And tonight, if he wants to save a lost soul, hey, it doesn't matter if you talk to him for five minutes or five years. When he gets ready to save them, he can save them. The man in the book, he said, you have to deal with somebody for months, even years, before somebody gets saved. And this week, or in the next three weeks, I'm going to show you from the Bible how God saves lost souls. I've got a diagram I'm going to draw and show you. I've got some illustrations, but tonight I'm going to preach a few minutes. And I've got to move around, folks. I was going to Dallas one time about five years ago, me and my wife. And a guy was texting on his phone and rear-ended us running 70 miles an hour. And if I stand still too long, somebody's going to have to come up here and carry me down. 
because my feet will lock up. So I keep moving so that my back don't lock up. So forgive me if I move around too much. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Y'all follow me. In verse number 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are, listen to this, now then, we are ambassadors. Now, for years, I've heard people preach this, and they misquote this verse. They say, like the United States, when they get up and teach it, they say that, uh, uh, say you're an ambassador to Russia. They don't say you're an ambassador for America. They say you're an ambassador of America. Y'all listen to me. It's a big difference. I am an ambassador for Jesus Christ. We have been commissioned by our Savior to be His representative on this world, in this world. And if we can't tell them about the love of God, what kind of ambassador are we being? Hey, I am an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Tonight you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And that is what God wants us to do. Did you know that if he didn't have a purpose for you, he'd already took you home? You ever thought about that? When I was a young preacher one time, I prayed. I said, Lord, whenever I get to the place in my life where you can't use me, I don't want to be here anymore. You know what that means, don't you? Whenever I'm done, I'm out of here. That was my prayer. Tonight, you have got to be convinced in your heart of some things so that you can go be a soul winner. Now, first thing I want to tell you is soul winning is not easy. It is easy, but it's not easy. You see, when you decide to step out and be a soul winner, maybe you used to be a soul winner, and now you're thinking, well, God can't use me no more because I quit and I haven't done it for a while. I got news for you that when I was in Louisiana for about eight months, I worked at a company. I worked 70, 80, 90 hours a week, and I didn't go soul winning for almost a year, Brother Bob. And I came here, and, and I came to church, and it felt like home, and I thought, praise God, we've got a church that loves God, and we've got a pastor that loves souls, and it's a wonderful place to be, and I want to get back to serving God like I used to. And so Sunday after church, you know what I did? I went soul winning. I went out knocking doors just like I used to. Had eight people saved. And I got so excited because in my mind I thought God can't use me anymore because I haven't been doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Some of you sitting here tonight used to be soul winners and you're thinking, man, it's going to be hard. God won't use me no more. I can't win none no more. I want to tell you something tonight. If you will step out by faith, God will use you. Now, when I got saved, I had to tell everybody. That's just my personality. And I didn't know how to tell everybody, so I met Brother Bob Bowen. And Brother Bowen taught me how to go soul winning. And I went to that soul winning conference, and he said, you need to go door to door. He said, you need to go person to person. He said, Don't. He said talk to everybody you meet. And so guess what I did? I mean, I'm just dumb enough to listen. He said, get you a book and write down everybody you talk to. And I started soul winning. I got a guy in the church. This was, I was just an associate pastor. And I said, hey, come soul winning with me. He was the Sunday school superintendent. And he said, okay, let's go. So we went soul winning and we knocked 70 doors. And 70 doors got slammed in my face. And I called Brother Bowen. I said, it don't work. He said, Brother Owens, it works. He said, what are you doing? I said, everything you told me. 
He said, what are you telling the people? I said, well, I don't have time to talk to them because they slammed the door in my face. He says, keep going, Brother Owens. He said, faint not. I said, all right. So I kept going. We got to the hundredth door, 100. It's written down in my original sewing Bible. I have about 12 of these full of names. In my first one, I actually wrote down a hundred doors, and I wrote on the back of it, slam the door, slam the door, slam the door. Wouldn't talk to me. Too busy eating supper, on the phone. Every reason they wouldn't talk to me. And on the one hundredth person, I opened the door, or they opened the door, and, and this guy answered the door. I said, hello, my name's Chad Owens. I'm out with Unity Baptist Church. And I, I had to talk fast because usually they slam the door. I said, I'm out with Unity Baptist Church, and, and, and I would like to invite you to church. He said, okay. I looked at my soul winning partner. I thought, praise the Lord, he didn't slam the door. And I said, well, uh, well, here, let me give you the, the invitation. And he took the invitation, and I said, uh, uh, by the way, what's your name? You know what his name was? Michael Jackson. <laughs> I said, I'll never forget him. I said, well, Michael Jackson, I'm so glad that you, you said that you'd come visit with us. And I, Oh, by the way, before I leave, let me ask you a question. I said, I ask everybody this question. I didn't tell him I would ask everybody this question, but I hadn't really talked to nobody yet. I said, I'd like to ask you this question, Mike. He said, what is it? I said, Michael, if you died today, would you go to heaven? And he said there for a minute, and he said, I don't know. Boy, I, um, do you want to know? He said, please. And I looked at my, I looked at my soul winning partner and my mind went blank. I mean, I, I dreamed of that day when somebody would allow me to tell them about Jesus Christ properly. And my mind went blank. I looked at him, he looked at me, I said, what now? He said, I don't know, here, take the Bible. And then the Holy Spirit started dealing with my heart and his heart. And I realized something. Do you know sometimes God makes it hard so you won't turn around and quit? Do you know sometimes God's testing you to see if you really want what you asked him for? Because before I started those hundred doors, I asked God, I said, Lord, let me be a soul winner. God, give me souls for my labor. Please let me go out and win souls. And for a hundred doors, I had no, 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 no. And I probably should have quit. But you know what? I said, I got a bigger God than this. And I'm going to keep going until I win somebody for him. And after Michael accepted Christ, I had 22 more that day receive Christ as their Savior. It was like God said, okay, you mean it. And I haven't really stopped since then except for when my wife was in the hospital there for a while. I kind of got away from God for a little bit. Not backslidden, just I wasn't as close as I used to be. Oh, I still talk to people. I had most of my neighborhood got saved. But I didn't weekly on purpose go out like I did before. Not till I came here. Not till I got back in church like I was supposed to. Listen, folks, there's some things that you need to be a, you need to get a hold to these things if you want to be a soul winner. Number one, you need to realize how much God loves you. You need to quit putting a question mark where God put a period. You need to quit questioning God's love. That's what these guys that write these books saying that so many, hey, God loves, the Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Hey, if he crucified his own son for my sins, doesn't he want people to get saved? Doesn't he love you? I mean, look at what he did. That's the biggest picture of love I've ever seen in my life. His son hanging on a cross. The Bible said his body was so beaten you couldn't even hardly tell he was a man. He was bleeding. They plucked his beard. They spit on him. I'm talking about the king of kings, the son of God. Hey, but he loves you. 
Not only does he love you, he loves the lost. And when you get that settled in your mind that God, hey, folks, I struggled for years that God loved me. I mean, I really did. I mean, how could God love somebody? I mean, I know he loved the world. But when it came personal, when he loved Chad Owens, that just blows me away. God, he knew me and he loved me anyway. I mean, it blows me away that he would let them do the things they did to him for somebody like me. I want to tell you all something here tonight. You know, if you never sinned in your life and I was the only sinner, Jesus would have still died. But not just me. If you was the only sinner, Jesus would have hung on that cross for you. In fact, I had a preacher once tell me, he said, you know where it says, for God so loved the world? He said, put your name there. For God so loved Chad Owens that he gave his only begotten son. Folks, you need to realize tonight how much God loves you. He's not playing around. He loves you. I'll tell you some things about soul winners. You know, God takes special care of his soul winners. I'm going to get into that next week. You say, well, God loves me just as much as he loves you. Yeah, he does. But if you've got two employees and one's doing everything they're supposed to do and one of them's just kind of slacking off, which one do you think the boss is going to give a raise to? God takes care of his soul winners. God takes care of those that love what he loves. Are y'all okay? Man, it's getting quiet in here. Not much longer and I'll be doing time with you. Oh yeah, y'all still got... Yeah, you all right? People wrestle with the fact of how much God truly loves them. You need to know that God loved you when you were lost and undone. Romans 5, 8, but, when we, uh, but God committed His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us when we was no good. Second, you need to realize that God wants to save sinners. Second Peter verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you realize how much God loves us? You know what I do sometimes? Y'all, y'all just... Bow your head and close your eyes for just a minute. You know, you know what a witness is? I want you to just close your eyes and think about this. A witness is a person who tells what they've seen and what they've heard. If they go past that, then their witness is not credible. Did you know tonight by, by the eye of faith you can see the gospel? Why you got your eyes closed, I want you to picture the Roman soldiers as they took Jesus and they nailed his hands to the cross. I want you to realize that all the power of creation was in the one that was being nailed to that wooden cross. As he laid there, he could have called legions and legions of angels to wipe out the world, but the Bible said that he looked past all that shame to the glory that was ahead. And that glory was coming to know you. But he laid there beaten and, and, and badly bruised and, and bloody and his visage was so marred you couldn't even tell he was a man. And they stood that cross up. You see, they did something different with Jesus. They nailed his feet. Usually they put a pedestal down there for him to stand on, but they nailed his feet to the cross. So as he was hanging there and the weight of his body was pulling on his arms, he would have to gasp. Y'all, y'all still looking at it? Y'all still seeing it in your, in your eye of faith? He, you can hear him gasp. <laughs> as he was breathing, trying to, trying to take a breath, and it would pull. Every time he would breathe, it would pull on those nails in his hands. At any moment, he could have came down. But he was driven by his love for us. As he hung there and the heavens was darkened and he cried out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they took the spear and they 
stuck it in his ribs, and forthwith came water and blood. And Jesus said, it is finished, and bowed his head and died. And the day that you came to that cross and received Christ as your Savior, you was washed under that precious blood. And you became a child of God, your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Your sins forgiven, justified in the sight of God Almighty. Just simply by placing your faith in the crucified one. Did y'all see that? I know my words are poverty stricken, but did you see it? If you did, you can be a witness. Y'all can look back up here at me. I just wanted you to see that for a minute. A witness is a person that has seen and heard an event. Did you know that God called us to be witnesses? I wasn't there, but I was there. You know what I mean? How was you there, Brother Owens? Because it's recorded in the Bible. And as you read it, the Bible said the Spirit reveals these things to us. As you read it and He shows you then you can tell others. So winning is not about you trying to convince somebody to do something, by the way. So winning, when I go out so winning, yes, I'm trying to get as many people as I can because numbers are important. You say, well, why is numbers important, brother? I don't know. Why did God record that he fed 5,000? Why did God record that he fed 3,000? Why did God record on the day of Pentecost that 3,000 was added to the church? Why did he put those numbers? Because numbers are important because he wants us to reach as many as we can. It's not so that I can say, hey, I want 10 people today. It's so that we can kind of gauge whether or not we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, I think. Today I want so winning. I asked my wife, I told her, I said, I'm preaching on soul winning tonight. I need to at least go soul winning. I went soul winning for three hours. And I couldn't find nobody. And I came home and I went in my, my bedroom and I got on my knees and I said, God, I want to win somebody today. Show me somebody somewhere that needs to hear the gospel. And about supper time, I told wife, I'm going soul winning. I wasn't about to get up here and preach on so one in the night if I didn't win somebody today. So I went out in all my normal spots and nobody. I went to this one laundromat. By the way, that's a good place to go so in. They're in there folding their clothes. They're not going to leave their clothes. Jail and laundromats are a good place to go so in. And they might get to folding real quick and appreciate you when they're done because they got done with their laundry a lot quicker, but they're not going to leave their stuff there. I went in and talked to everybody, and everybody was already saved. And I'm thinking, Lord, I want to win somebody today for you. Help me. About that time, out of the corner of my eye, I seen a man sitting in a car. Big man. He had a beard bigger than yours, Josh. Big old beard, big old guy. And I thought, sure. <laughs> Why not? I walked up, knocked on his door on his car, and, and he was looking at his phone, had his glasses. Can I help you? I said, I don't know, maybe I can help you. He said, well, what do you need? I said, I don't need nothing. I said, what do you need? And then I laughed. And he said, well, are you messing with me? I said, just a little bit. I said, I'm out with Bible Baptist Church. I said, I just come to invite you to church. So. He said, oh, okay. He said, I thought you was a cop. Anyway, a lot of people think I'm a police officer. I don't look like a police officer. Maybe it was the gun and the No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> but I, 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 I looked down in his car, and folks, I'm going to tell you something. When the Holy Spirit's working, and he's working through you, you know it. No other feeling like it in the world. And I locked eyes with him. I said, sir, I want to ask you a question before I leave. Big old guy. I said, if you died today, would you go to heaven? And he just hung his head. He said, no, sir, I wouldn't. 
I said, so you're telling me that if you died, you'd wind up in hell? He said, more than likely. And I, what I always do is I, I try to make it comfortable when I'm talking to people. And I said, are you comfortable with that? He said, no, I'm not. And I said, well, I can help you tonight. And I opened my Bible and I started telling him how uh, uh, Romans 3.23, and, and I'm going to go over all these with you. And, and I've got little illustrations that God's given me through the years. And you'll get your own and maybe you can use the ones that I've used. But, but I opened my Bible in Romans 3.23 and I said, hey, let me tell you some things from the Word of God. I said, look, I'm not making this up. It's right here. It's important that you show them the Word of God. I mean, we're not making this stuff up. God's Word is powerful, man. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. God's Word, hey, when it says powerful, it means like dynamite. You get them in God's Word, something's going to happen. And I opened the Bible up, and I showed him that, and I said, hey, for uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I said, sir, do you agree with that statement? I said, this is the Word of God. He said, I agree with it. I said, I'm a preacher, evangelist now. He said, but I've sinned. I said, my pastor, he's a good man. He loves lost people. He helps everybody he can. I said, but I want to tell you something. The Bible said my pastor has sinned. I said, in fact, every person in the world has sinned except one, and I'll tell you about him in a minute. I said, let me tell you what that, that got you. This is what I do. I take my little soul winning Bible, and I'll usually take my tracks, and I'll say, this is God and this is man. And I say, because of our sin, the Bible says we come short of His glory. That's separated. I said, we're separated from God because of sin. And if we die with that sin, his name was Demetri. Y'all pray for Demetri. I said, Demetri, if we die with that sin, God's got to put us in hell. He said, well, I really try to be a good guy. I said, let me show you something. I said, this is society. And this is a man who kills a bunch of people. They put him in prison with three 99-year sentences. You know what that means? He's going to die in prison. And let's say he's separated from society in prison and he decides, you know what, I'm not going to kill nobody else. I'm going to be good. I'm not going to cuss. I'm going to make up my bed. I'm going to say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. I'm going to do all these things. I said, is he still separated from society? And he said, well, of course. He's never getting back with it. Not until his crime is paid for. I said, it just so happens he's going to die there. I said, that's our problem. God didn't say for you to be good to get back. He said, you were separated because of sin. I said, not only are you separated because of sin, I said, but the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23, for the wages of sin is death. Hey, not only are you separated now, but the price is eternally being separated in a lake of fire forever and ever and ever. And I looked over there and this big guy was weeping. I'm talking about tears rolling down into his beard, Josh. I mean, I'm just using the word of God. And then I took him over there and showed him over in Romans chapter 10, verse eight, nine, or 9 and 10, and verse number 13. And, and I said, sir, what do you think you need to do? He said, well, according to what you've told me, sir, I need to ask Jesus to save me. You tell me so when it don't work. It doesn't work when you do it. It only works when you take God with you and He speaks to their heart as you give them the Word of God. But anyway, we had one saved tonight. Amen. Praise be to God. I can't help but think, you know, I, I remember faces, may not remember all the names, about the 45th person that got saved, I want to say right along in there, was a little bitty girl. Her name was Kayla. And I went up, I, I, she was a little bitty thing, probably about my granddaughter's age. I knocked on the door, and this guy came to the door, and his name was David, and his wife's name was Lisa, and they came to the door, and I started sharing the gospel, and he was one of them tough guys, but so was I, so it didn't bother me a bit. You know what I'm saying? Everything he threw at me, I caught it and chunked it back. And he eventually 
after showing him the truth from the Bible, he broke down and started telling me all these things he'd done and said that God wouldn't forgive him, and I read it to him again. And he said, do you think God would forgive me? I said, David, God would forgive you right this minute and save your lost soul. Him and Lisa and this little bitty girl, stand, I'm talking about, I'm standing there talking to these two, and that little girl migrated over here. I mean, she had a hard life in that, in that home. She did. But she migrated over here, and she was standing close to me. And I said, well, Dave and Lisa, if you want to be saved tonight, I said, you know, I can't save you. I said, you can't save yourself. You can't wash away your sins. I said, but I, I'm going to introduce you to one that can. And I shared a, a few more things out of the Bible, and then I prayed for them. And folks, this is something. I'm just trying to give you tips. I'm going to show you all this Wednesday night. But when I, before I lead somebody to Christ, you, you know, I don't think you're just supposed to get them to say a prayer. I, I believe there, there's got to be conviction before there's conversion. I believe God's got to do it. I mean, I, every bit of it's got to be from God. So before I lead somebody to Christ, I bow my head and I say, y'all mind if I pray for you? And they say, I've never had nobody told me no. And we all bow our heads. I mean, i got pictures all over America. In a courthouse, I had a whole group of people with their heads bowed and their hats in their hand in the courthouse. And this is my prayer. Even if they tell me, you know, they're not certain or whatever, listen to me. I ask God, I say, Father, I want to pray for this, this couple here tonight. And I ask you to convict their heart and show them their lost condition. And I ask you, sweet Spirit of God, that you would put such conviction on them that they will not be comfortable until they get saved. And then I say, with my head still bowed, their head still bowed, I say, if you want to be saved, I can't save you, but if you want to be saved, let's ask Jesus to save you. Just pray with me. And then, then I will have them pray with me. And that's what I did with this couple. And the little girl was about four or five, and I really wasn't paying attention to her. But God was. And she, she said, Mama, Mama, can I get saved? And, and she said, Not now. Not now. And I said, if you want to be saved, call out to Jesus Christ, and I can help you. And I led them through a prayer. And I said, amen, and mom and dad stand there just weeping. And then that little girl, she said, I'm saved, I'm saved. She grabbed my britches, and she was pulling down on it. I'm saved, I'm saved, I did it too, mama. Well, he, he got in some trouble later on, wound up. You know, when you sow bad seed, you're going to get a crop. He did some bad things, and it caught up to him, and he wound up in prison. Family got dispersed, but that little girl showed up at, at our church when she was 19. And she said, my life has been hard, Brother Owens, but I'm still saved. Amen. You see, God loves the lost. He don't love what they do, but he loves them. What time is it? Two minutes. I didn't even get through the whole message. you got to realize that sin is the problem and Jesus is the solution. You need to realize that they won't come. They must be brought. They won't learn. They must be taught. It's our job. To take it to them. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. In Acts chapter 1, he said that himself, it's in red letters in my Bible, that he would give us the power that we needed to be witnesses unto him. Do you know what will take the fear out of soul winning for you? Do you understand what the word power really means? The Bible says in what is it, First John one twelve, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And Jesus said, and power shall come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. What is the word power? Is it some mystic make the hair stand up on the back of your neck? Do you know why 
Y'all look at me. I want to tell you something tonight. I am one of the most introverted people you'll ever meet. I got out of the military with a social phobia. I didn't even like people touching me. I didn't go to the doctor because they might touch me. I don't like standing in front of crowds because people look at me. Just like y'all are doing right now. What's wrong with you? But God has given me power. What does that mean, Brother Bob? The word power means authority. You know why I'm doing what I'm doing? Because of God's authority. And you may not understand that, but I understand it very well. I can't go out and arrest anybody. I'm not a police officer, right? But if the sheriff says, we're having problems and today I authorize you to be a deputy sheriff. Woohoo! You better watch out. I can arrest you then. Not on my authority, but on the authority of the one that was sending me. Tonight I can do what I do because of his authority. I got a hold of that when I was a young Christian. I can stand up here and preach to you tonight with His authority. People get saved because of His authority on my life. And guess what? It's yours too. You just got to take it. You just got to use it. And we'll get into that next week. I'm trying to hurry. Y'all ready? You want me to just cut off right here? Y'all tell me. I will right now. Five more minutes? Can y'all do five more minutes? I don't want nobody to get mad at me because I know five more minutes, okay? We have been commissioned by our Savior, our friend, our Lord, and our leader. He has commissioned us to go. He said in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature right before he left the earth. He said, I want you to go. Over in the book of John, he said, As my Father hath sent me. You know, he could have used, the Holy Spirit could have used any word there. He could have said, Even so send I y'all. Y'all know that's per, that, that would be a personal, that would have meant the one standing there. Imagine how he said, Even so uh, uh, I send you. God sent you and you. That's personal. By the way, that verse says, go ye. You ain't going to win one soul sitting on your couch. Josh, you can't go fit, can't catch a bunch of fish if you never get on the water. You can sit around and talk about fishing all you want, but you ain't going to get any in your freezer until you get a fishing pole or some bait and find some water and start chunking it out there. You ain't going to win one until you get up and get off your couch and go soul winning. Are y'all still, y'all got quiet on that one. My, my question is, is what's our excuse going to be when you see him face to face? And he's looking at you with those eyes that see right through you. And he said, why didn't you go? No wonder the Bible says that every mouth or every tongue shall be stopped. You ain't going to have an answer. I'm not going to have an answer. He gave us everything we needed. He said, just take what I've got right here and go give it out. You ain't got to make nothing up. Just use his... His plan, it works. Three more minutes. You need to realize that there's a place called hell. The penalty of sin is eternity in a place called hell, Romans 6, 23. It's a place of judgment. It's a place of torment. You can find all this in Luke chapter 15. It's a place of hopelessness. It's a place of thirst. It's a place of fire. It's a place of darkness. It's a place of remorse. It's a place of godlessness. God won't be there. 
There won't be any beauty in hell. There won't be any uh, beautiful little babies. There won't be any laughter. There won't be any smiling. It's going to be a dismal, dry, dark place of fear. It really gets to me sometimes that I don't love people enough to try to keep them out of that place. After all, God loved them enough. God loved me enough. I mean, who am I to, to not take the, the beautiful message of the gospel and give it to a lost world? Because of my little fears. Shame on us. Shame on me. Who cares what they think? I had some little old girl today mouth off at me and roll her eyes. You know what I said? Well, bless your heart. Have a good day. <laughs> I can't make them get saved. I've had them call me all kinds of names. I had one guy wanting to kill me. I had a Muslim guy want to chop my head off. In fact, he said, if you come back here tomorrow... I said, really? I accept the challenge. I went that night. You know, the Bible, listen to me. So many things God does with his soul winners. I went to the king of Ghana. I sat in his living room. And there was about 20 armed men around me. In my group, there was five of us. Now, those with me, they, they weren't right with God because he offered us drinks and they drank it and it was alcohol, I'm telling you. I smelt it and I said, uh, you don't just talk to a king. I said, he said, speak. I said, I can't drink this. The other guys were over like, <laughs> I said, they ain't supposed to be. He said, why not? I said, it's alcohol. I said, the book of Proverbs says, you're a fool if you even look at it when it moveth or right by itself. I said, I can't drink it. I'm a recovered alcoholic. I can't do it. He motioned for his guys. They came and took our drinks and brought us some pineapple juice. He said, Pastor Owens. I said, yes, King. He said, how do you see Africa? And you don't want to be honest with them on something like that. I mean, it's, it's rough. I said, I see it beautiful. But I was talking about the people. I said, it's beautiful. It's some of the sweetest people I've ever met right here. He said, have you had any problems? What? Hang on. Quick question, King. He says, his name was uh, uh, Nana, King, King Nana. I said, uh, uh, King Nana, I said, what? I said, can, can, can I bring something up? He said, yeah. I said, I was preaching today. And by the way, I'm not going to stand on it, but see this Lord's Supper table? When I would go to a village and preach, they have these tables everywhere with goods on it, groceries, pineapples, mangoes, oranges, all kind of stuff. Well, the guys I would with would go wipe everything, just, and they would put me up on the table. And they would hold the table, and here, I, I mean, I was, back then, I was a big old boy. I was pushing 300 pounds. And that old table would be wobbling, you know, and I'm preaching, and, and people, and not only did they put me up there, but I had a guitar player. They put him right beside me. He was a big old boy. I could just see that table. Go, I said, we was on the table preaching like we do. By the way, he got saved, and I baptized him. And... Anyway, we were up there doing what we did and preaching and preaching to him. And, and, and I said, and King, this guy came and told me he's going to cut my head off. Muslim guy. He said, where, where at? I said, well, you know, when you go to Sufia and you hang a left headed to Asamang, I said, that big mosque right there. I didn't know it was a mosque. I'm standing there on this table with my back to the mosque, and he's got big speakers up there, and I'm preaching a gospel to about 10,000 people, and people getting saved, and he stopped it. He said, he's going to cut my head off tomorrow. He said, hmm. That's all he said. He said, hmm. I said, do you really think he'll do it? He said, Pastor. I said, yeah. He said, 
don't worry. I said, so I'll go back and preach there again tomorrow? He said, no problem. King said, there's no problem. I'm going to preach. I go back the next day and I look over there to see if the, you know, if the guy was coming out with a sickle because I just knew that night I was going to lose my mind. <laughs> Y'all listen to me now. They was a beautiful green mosque with a copper top. You know how they make them. It was made out of concrete. We got there that next day about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and there wasn't even a brick they had made a beautiful inlaid brick road that went right up, and they had all these beautiful flowers and plants. and all. There wasn't even a brick left on that piece of property. That night, King Nana, I don't know how he did it, but they went and took that place apart and disposed of it. It was just a big square red piece of dirt. By the way, we preach on that piece of dirt now. So I went back that night and I seen the king. I said, yes, pastor. He said, by the way, he said, we're friends. He said, you don't have to raise your hand anymore. I said, chief, king, quick question. What happened to the mosque? <laughs> and the guy that wanted to kill me. He said, hmm, don't worry about it. <laughs> Pretty neat stories, huh? You know, it's a shame that most Christians will never see the power of God and never have a story to tell because they won't trust Him enough to take His glorious message. I mean, think about it for just a minute. Does God want people saved? Does he? How much does he want them saved? Look at the cross. Did he not tell you to go? And if you go, do you think for one minute that he won't go with you and give you everything you need to do what he asked you to do? Do you understand tonight God loves you more than your mama? He loves your kids more than you do. And if that's the case, why should we be scared to go out and tell somebody? I got a message I preach sometimes. It's called, I serve a big God. I'm a big God Christian. I don't serve a little G God. I serve a big G God. A God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that I'm able to ask or even think. My question is, is why ain't more of us going out doing this? It's time to get rid of excuses. Jesus is coming soon. You're not going to be able to say, well, I, I'm sorry, Lord, my DVR wasn't working, and I, I had to record the voice. He's going to say, you let people go to hell for what? You was disobedient because of what? Hey, y'all don't get mad at me. Come back next week. Next week, we're going to try to get the Bible so they didn't make it in. And we're going to show you some illustrations, and I'm going to work with some folks, and I'm going to show you some ways that you can comfortably talk to somebody. You know what I used to tell my people? If you are scared to talk to somebody... Give them a track and run. But get it to them. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Brother Bob, give me that look. Every head bowed, every eye closed.